All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be making a Dunkelsweissen, or Dunkelsweiss beer, as it's sometimes known. And stay tuned to find out why I think that is probably one of the best bang-for-your-buck beers out there. Hey, if it's your first time here, welcome to the channel. I'm happy you're here. This channel is all about making grain of glass videos, which basically means that I take a recipe from start to finish, the whole way through. I tell you the recipe, I brew the beer, I ferment the beer, I talk about the beer, all in the same video. Uh, so you get to see every single piece of that process in one single video instead of searching around for a different tasting video somewhere else on my channel. If you like that kind of thing, go down, hit that subscribe button, smash that like button. All those things help us out quite a bit. Today we're making a Dunkelweizen. The reason why I think this is probably the best bang for your buck beer is because A, it's actually pretty easy to brew, especially if you happen to have a uh, all grain kind of pull out basket or brew in a bag type system where you don't have to sparge. B, also, I think it is a great marriage of texture and flavor, and you get all of the best parts of both a classic German Hefeweizen, as well as a more malty and sweeter and caramelly fruity type of darker German beer like Albach, all without being very strong. It's a dark wheat beer that has a full body, but it is not powerfully strong. So it's only gonna be about 5%, still a relatively sessionable beer. So you get all of that flavor in a relatively lower ABV package. Some people, myself included, struggle to get a lot of uh, extra flavor out of a Hefeweizen sometimes. It, sometimes it doesn't have the richness that we're really looking for, um, especially if we're not decoction mashing it, that's obvious. Um, but with a Dunkelweizen, you don't have to worry about missing out on that richness. There's enough extra caramel specialty malts in there that actually do provide a ton of that richness and a ton of that depth of flavor, which is one of the main highlights of this style. We're looking for a beer at the end of the day here that is about 5-ish percent ABV, uh, has that silky smooth awesome wheat beer texture, uh, nice banana esters from your yeast, and maybe a little bit of the clove and the phenols, depending on how we want to ferment it, as well as a ton of flavor contribution from some continental caramel malts and uh, a little touch of carafa too to add a nice dark brown color. Now, when I said easy and wheat beer in the same sentence, I'm sure some people are like, what the hell is wrong with you? Every time I brew wheat beer, I get a suck spark. That's a very real possibility if you are not doing brew in a bag or brew in a basket like I am. If you want to have a successful sparge with a wheat beer, you almost always are gonna to need to add at least one, maybe two pounds of rice hulls into your mash. Otherwise, you may wanna look into something more advanced like a step mash or even a decoction mash uh, to take care of those beta-glucans and ensure that your work can water properly. In any case, I am doing brew in a basket with a claw hammer supply system, but I also am adding rice hulls as well because effectively when you're draining it, you are laudering it, and I just kind of want to ensure I get a, a better efficiency. But rice hulls are stupid cheap and it's easy to add to your beer, so I really don't see a reason not to. I absolutely love brewing and drinking wheat beers, especially German wheat beers. They have a totally different character from any other barley-based beer out there, and they're quite a lot of fun to make. About a year ago, I went ahead and I did the whole smash uh, I decoction mashed and open fermented a Hefeweizen, uh, and it was a process. Um, <laughs> I learned a lot from that, and I'm telling you the decoction mashing a Hefeweizen is an absolute pain in the butt. I would say, I would only recommend it to you if you're particularly interested in doing it old, old, old school. Uh, it's fun, but it's a hell of a lot of process. I ended up having to brew the beer twice because I scorched the first batch and I ended up having a ton of laudering problems in both batches. Um, it is a long, arduous process, but the beer that comes out of it is generally pretty good. And if you're looking for that kind of X factor that you're missing, why doesn't your beer taste like Weinstefaner? It's probably because you're not the decoction mashing, you're not generating enough of those melanoidins and caramelization in the actual mash, um, which is a very hotly debated subject within the homebrew community. My opinion on it is that it is definitely worth doing if you're interested in it. Um, it does have a tangible impact to the flavor of the beer, but it also could be subjective due to the fact that you're spending about an extra three hours on a brew day working on your beer and actively stirring a mash for like 90 minutes kind of gets old. Um, it is a massive pain in the butt, but it's a lot of fun if you love what you're doing. But I will stand by the statement that it is not necessary to brew a good beer with it. Um, you can always substitute in 4 to 8% melanoid and malt in your grist uh, to replicate the flavors of a decoction. It's not going to be an exact match, uh, but it will get you in that ballpark. It's often worth it to save me that uh, three hours on brew day because oftentimes, I'm sure like many of you, I just don't have the time. 
All right, so let's dive into the recipe now. So for starters, we have six pounds of German wheat malt, uh, and that is just enough to get us over 50% of the grist because by German law, a wheat beer must be at least 50% wheat malt. And that dates all the way back to the Reinheitsgebot. Now, given that I don't live in Germany and I'm not producing commercial beer for the Germans, uh, I don't necessarily need to follow that rule. However, it's kind of fun to do it anyway, um, and it makes for a pretty good wheat beer when you do. So we're gonna take that six pounds and we're gonna add four and a half pounds of dark Munich malt. This is about a 20 Lava Bond Munich malt and it adds a increased level of toastiness and richness uh, to the character that you would normally get from regular or 10 Lava Bond Munich malt. Adding to that about half a pound of melanoid and malt, like I discussed earlier, that is to replicate the flavors of a decoction mash. And another half a pound of Special B, which is a very intense but also delicious caramel malt. When used correctly, Special B can produce some incredible flavors in your beer that you can't get from any other standard like Caramel 80, Caramel 120 kind of thing. Um, it is a Belgian malt that's typically used in something like a Belgian quad, and the result of that is you get these really nice kind of raisiny fruitcake-like flavors. And that is exactly what we want to experience in this beer. And then we're gonna add two ounces of Carafa 2, which is a roasted, blackened, debittered malt. Uh, so the effect of that is to have a high level of color in the beer uh, without any roast whatsoever. And two ounces of Carafa 2 is all you need. Um, it is just enough to turn this beer quite brown. We want it brown, we don't want it black. Um, and of course I'm adding one pound of rice hulls as well to everything just because it's probably a good idea. For hops, I am only using one single bittering hop addition for a measly 13 IBUs, and that is Tradition. I'm using three quarters of an ounce of German Tradition at 5.7% alpha acid at 60 minutes, and that is it. For yeast, we're going to be using the classic Hefeweizen strain, the Weinstefaner strain. Um, that is Y yeast 3068 Weinstefan Weizen. So, for the water profile in the beer, I'm going to be doing 44 parts per million of calcium, 6 parts per million of magnesium, 40 parts per million of sodium, 44 parts per million of sulfate, 84 parts per million of chloride, and 71 parts per million of bicarbonate. That water profile is geared towards uh, a high chloride level to ensure that you have a, uh, a malt-biased beer. Um, the, the flavor at the end of it should not be dry feeling, it should be full-bodied. Um, we're also adding a significant contribution of sodium in there to kind of enhance the, uh, the fullness and richness of the body of the beer. And also we're going to add a little bit of a uh, medium bicarbonate level in there just to ensure that the mash pH is in check because we have um, a relatively darker beer. The mash on this is going to be mashed a little bit higher, about 154 Fahrenheit to give us a relatively higher final gravity of about hopefully 1015 or 1016 uh, so that we have some little bit of residual sweetness left in this beer. All right, so now we're just waiting on the water to get heated up. And it's weird, with the exception of one snowstorm, every single brew day I've done this winter has been really warm. So I'm gonna be outside today again, and uh, it's a beautiful day. So once that heats up, I'll catch you guys with a mash in. Once my strike water reached the mash in temperature, I mashed in with the grain bill, mixing in the rice hulls and being sure to break up any clumps in the mash. Next, I started the recirculation and let the mash sit for about 90 minutes at 154 degrees to ensure complete conversion. Unfortunately, I forgot to check the pH during this mash, so uh, let's just hope it ended up being correct. After 90 minutes had elapsed, I observed a brown colored wort and I set the temperature on the controller to 168 degrees for the mash out. This denatures all enzymes in the mash and helps the wort drain through the grain bed a bit easier. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for about 15 minutes and then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for another 15 minutes. However, as soon as I did that, I fired up the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on the boil. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading, and I recorded a measurement of 11.8 bricks, or about 1046, which is a bit lower than Beersmith had estimated. Once I reached the boil, I added my 60 minute bittering charge of 3 quarters of an ounce of Tradition, and 50 minutes later, I came back to add some yeast nutrient. That's it and started recirculating boiling wort through my chiddler to sanitize it. This is the easiest way to ensure sanitation of your chilling equipment. After 10 more minutes had elapsed, I ended the boil and I took the entire setup inside where I could hook up the chiller to the kitchen sink and began chilling. I took a sample and I recorded an original gravity of 13 bricks, 
which is about 1051. Still lower than planned, but adjusting my actual planning efficiency in Beersmith to about 65% seemed to correct this issue and should be good for any brews moving forward. Once the wort reached my groundwater temperature of about 65 degrees, I transferred to the fermenter, splashing to aerate, and I pitched my yeast. Since I elected to do a quasi-open fermentation on this beer, I simply poked some holes in a sanitized piece of tin foil and covered the fermenter with this for the first few days, switching to a traditional airlock a few days later after the Krausen had fallen. One of the reasons why I think this beer in particular is actually a good one for beginners is because it's got a very, very forgiving fermentation. Basically, the vice beer yeast can ferment anywhere from basically 60 degrees all the way up to the mid-70s, and you'll get different results for the different temperatures, um, but depending on what you're looking for, any of those results could be desirable. In this case, I'll be showing you what you can get if you ferment at basically room temperature, 68 to 72 degrees. Uh, and what that is going to do is it's going to push a lot more of a banana type ester. The higher the fermentation temperature is with a vice beer yeast, the more banana you're going to get. Now, take that and flip it on its head, you go down onto the lower end of the spectrum, the mid 60s, you'll end up pushing more of a phenol, which is going to create a different kind of flavor, more like a clove type of flavor. Now that can be off-putting for some people, um, and I've experienced clove bomb hefeweizens in the past, which are somewhat overpowering. So uh, just something to keep in mind with your fermentation is what kind of ester or phenol do you want to push, uh, depending on your temperature. Other than that, this yeast and this beer style does not need really that much babying. Um, I'm not pitching that much yeast right now because in order to promote a little bit more ester production, uh, we're going to kind of stress the yeast just a tiny bit by pitching just the regular packet, no starter involved, um, which does create a slightly slower fermentation, but this yeast ferments like a beast and it doesn't really need all that much help and will end up pushing out a lot more of those desirable esters. This is one of those beers that unless it's like the middle of the summer and your air conditioning is broken, you can pretty much ferment this one without any sort of temperature control and you'll get a good result. So there's also another piece of this fermentation that could be relatively easily explored and that is open fermentation. Traditionally, wheat beers and, uh, and the like are fermented in wide and shallow vessels with no lids or no containers. Uh, they are free and exposed to the air because the Krausen that is formed by the fermented yeast uh, effectively produces so much positive pressure with CO2 that it actually protects the beer quite effectively. This has been done traditionally for hundreds of years. Uh, and it actually produces an interesting phenomenon in that the ester production of the yeast is in fact magnified um, because the uh, fermentation is so vigorous. Um, and it is actually something that you can do at a homebrew scale. It's not as effective as if you had like a big wide shallow, you know, pool like fermenter. Um, but you can sort of replicate it if you have a bucket fermenter or any other wide fermenter. You're not really going to want to do something like this if you have like a conical, um, but a bucket is more than enough to do it. I've done it before myself, and it actually is pretty cool what happens. I'm actually going to do this in my fermentation as well. I have a Firmzilla all-rounder, which is actually a very wide vessel. Uh, so we're going to put it in there, and then we're just going to leave the lid off for the first couple days. And then once that Krausen activity starts to drop down, we'll just put that lid on, and it should be good to go. So in a nutshell, you'll ferment this for about two weeks at 68 to 72 degrees, or lower if you want more clove. And at that point, you should be good to bottle or keg. All right, so we were looking at a final gravity of about 1012 here on the Dougal Weizen. Kind of was hoping for something a little bit higher, about 1015, but uh, I'll take 1012, that is just fine. So fermentation went pretty much exactly as planned. We had a semi-open fermentation for the first couple of days with that piece of tin foil with a couple holes poked in it. As soon as I saw that Krausen was going down, I went ahead and I just put the uh, standard airlock back onto the fermenter and let it go that way for another about 10 days. I had a total fermentation time of about 12 days. And once that was complete, I decided to keg at that point. Now, I typically keg my beers because I just absolutely hate bottling. Um, as many people do, but uh, Weiss beer is definitely one of those styles that will benefit from a second fermentation in a bottle. Um, and I could have primed my keg as well, but I decided not to because I kind of wanted a beer on tap quickly. Now, if you go ahead and bottle this, um, or you prime your keg with priming sugar and have a second fermentation in either the bottle or the keg, you'll definitely get very good results by doing that and you'll have some added flavor complexity. So just keep that in mind. If you want to go the extra mile and do that, uh, it will only help you. All right, so it's called Brown Bess and comes in at 5.1% ABV and 13 IBUs. Mm -hmm. 
So for appearance of the beer, it's a nice kind of mild brown um, with obviously a significant amount of yeast haze and um, pours with a pretty robust head, but a little bit of an off-white head uh, with uh, some pretty awesome uh, structure. It does stick around for a while. There's a serious amount of head retention with this beer, obviously because of the uh, wheat content. And uh, it's a nice pleasing factor. It's a very good looking beer overall. All right, so now we'll go in for aroma. So the aroma I get off of this beer is actually really interesting. It's um, it's like kind of a banana chocolatey combo. It's kind of like a dark, heavy banana bread. There's a little bit of like a fruitcake kind of thrown in there. You do get the classic Weiss beer aroma, um, especially with that banana component in there. There's a lot of extra complexity that comes out of this one with the specialty malts. Um, and, and it's not like a caramel sweet aroma, but more of a bready uh, toned aroma. So now, next up, we'll go for mouthfeel. So this is a fairly highly carbonated beer um, on purpose. And um, it does have a little bit of a sharpness and a zing to it because of that carbonation. But other than that, the mouthfeel is extremely smooth and extremely soft and pillowy. Uh, because of that, again, that high wheat content makes this beer uh, have a very unique mouthfeel. You know, other than the carbonation, it's just a very soft, creamy, gentle mouthfeel, which is just really pleasant to drink. I think the higher mash temperature that I used for this beer um, definitely had an impact on the body, but it wasn't as much as I was expecting. But on the flip side of that, though, uh, the higher mash temperature did not result in an excess amount of sweetness, which is good because the beer remains balanced. And on that note, I think we should go into flavor. It's, um, it's a very, very complicated and flavorful beer. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think this style is such a good bang for your buck is just simply because you get so much flavor out of it. Um, it's not that much effort. First of all, again, a really nice kind of banana bread flavor. Uh, that's partially due to the fermentation temperature I selected and the Weiss beer yeast and the extra complication of the malt bill uh, when compared to a Hefeweizen, which gives it so much more dimension than a Hefeweizen. Because of the special B that I put in, I'm getting a little bit of a hint, and which that's exactly as much of this flavor as I want, a hint of raisin. Uh, so it is in there, like a figgy, raisiny, kind of light fruit cakey type of uh, character. And it's not too much, because the danger with a caramel malt like that is that you end up with an extra amount of residual sweetness, which can really throw off the balance of the beer, and it can kind of be a one-dimensional flavor, which in this case, it definitely isn't. I also get a really nice kind of accent of a toast flavor in there, kind of like a little hint of a, hint of a, a bread crusty, not quite roast, but just a little bit of a toasted bread crust character, um, which is a really nice combination with the rest of them. It, it works beautifully in this. Last but certainly not least, I'm getting a decent amount of like a spice character to this, and it's not the infamous clove that the Weiss beer yeast throws out in, in large quantity when you ferment it too cold. Um, it's more of like a cinnamon, uh, just a subtle, subtle cinnamon. It kind of reminds me of a very light, sessionable version of a holiday-themed Weissenbach that I had a couple months ago that was really good. Um, just this is obviously not a Weissenbach, but there's just this super subtle cinnamon um, that plays really well with the rest of the flavors in there, and that's 100% yeast. It's definitely a little bit of a phenol that came out. Uh, despite fermenting high, you're still going to get a little bit of that, and um, I think that's a nice balanced flavor. It's also got a really nice underlying grainy, weedy flavor um, that just plays in really well with the rest of them. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to describe other than just being kind of like grainy. <laughs> um, but it comes last and it's just very, very pleasant. Um, it's a wonderful combination of flavors. It's very similar to a Belgian double just without as much yeast expression and with a kind of, you know, a slightly different yeast profile as well. Um, and without being, you know, particularly strong. So overall, I think the beer is really good. It's definitely a bit young right now. Um, it's gonna continue to go through a maturation phase uh, as it continues to age for the next couple weeks. Uh, and it probably will improve as that goes on. 
But for the moment, this is great. I think the open fermentation is just a fun thing to do. I don't know whether or not it really contributed too much to the ester profile. So while I do get a lot of banana, um, it's definitely not the strongest flavor out of this whole thing. There's a lot more malt flavors to compete with, so I can't really definitively say whether or not the open fermentation had a tangible impact on the ester profile. That being said, it's still a lot of fun to do. And when I did it with my Hefeweizen, in, I can tell you that it did have an impact. So I think it's still worth doing. Overall, it's a really nice, easy drinking beer um, that does pretty well in the cold months. It's got enough body to back itself up and uh, to make for a, a decently long sipping beer. All right, so I think that's going to wrap it up for us. I think I'm going to try and keep this video a bit shorter than some of my other ones. All right, so once again, uh, the description box contains the recipe for this beer uh, as designed for the claw hammer system, which should translate pretty well over to an anvil or a grain father or robo brew, something like that. You should be able to tweak it and uh, come up with a very similar recipe. Once again, if you like the video, please hit the like button. And if you like watching this stuff on a regular basis, hit the subscribe button as well. It does make a big difference for me. I will put out a new Grand Glass video roughly every two to three weeks. But if you're interested in more frequent content, I have an Instagram, which is at the Apartment Brewer on Instagram, as well as a Patreon, where there's a lot of additional video content there. So uh, comment down below if you're interested in chatting about the beer or the brew or anything else related to home brewing. I do read every single comment, and I do my best to respond to as many of them as I can. If you like what you see and you want to make the beer on the claw hammer system of your own, there is a link in the description which will take you over to their site where you can check out the system if you're interested in purchasing it. Again, I do highly recommend it if you're kind of short on space and all you have is a 120 volt outlet. Last but certainly not least, down in the description box there's also links to Amazon to a lot of the other homebrewing gear that I use regularly. Uh, so if you want to check some of those out, that's also another great way to support this channel. Anyway, thank you so much for watching guys, I really do appreciate it, and I'll catch you guys in the next one, so until then, cheers.